It was June 20th, 1994, and the residents of every street, Dunedin, were just awaking from their slumber. The sun had barely risen, but just meters away, a mass murder had occurred. There were only two suspects, and one of them was dead. This is the Case Remains podcast, episode 11, part one, The Unsolved Murders of the Bain Family. It was nine past seven in the morning when dispatch officers in Dunedin, New Zealand, received a frantic call. The voice on the other end of the line was that of 22-year-old David Bain. Every street. 65 every street. They're all dead. Who's all dead? My, my family, they're all dead. Hurry up. It's okay. Every street that runs off, off Somerville Street? Yes. What number are you calling from? 454. Four, four, mm-hmm. 2527. Four, and your last name? Bain. Bain. Okay. We're on our way. Okay, Mr. Bain. It yeah, will be there very shortly. Police made their way to the address in Anderson's Bay, where the Baines had been living in a run-down family home. Officer Jeff Wiley and his partner Kim Stevenson arrived at the house, where an ambulance was already waiting outside. Looking through the window, Wiley saw someone's hand and a firearm laying on the floor. David Bain was still stood inside. David let the officers in, where they immediately found his father Robin dead in the living room, situated immediately to the right of the front door. They moved through the closely packed and cluttered rooms of the house, finding another body, then another, then another. Nearly every member of the Bain family had been killed. Everyone except for David. At the time of the murders, David was a student at the University of Otago, where he studied music and classics. He was an aspiring opera singer and was living at home, supplementing his studies with the cash he got from a newspaper round. David's parents, Robin and Margaret, had been married for 25 years, but were estranged by the summer of 1994, with Robin sleeping in the back of his van or spending nights at the school where he worked as a principal. He returned to the family home at weekends, but would sleep in a caravan at the end of the garden. They'd bought their home on every street back in 1974, but moved to Papua New Guinea that same year, where Robin worked as a missionary teacher. They had come back to the house in 1998, and they had since fallen into disrepair. The rooms were piled high with clothes, toys, knickknacks and rubbish. There were jammed windows, rotten clapboard, and maggots that had made the bathroom their home. The garden where Robin's caravan was parked was equally as chaotic, with wood and broken furniture strewn about the lawn. Sharing the house with Robin and Margaret were three of their four children, As well as David, there was 19-year-old Arawa, who was enrolled in teacher training, and 14-year-old Stephen, a high school student. Lanyette, their 18-year-old daughter, lived away from home, first in a flat in town before moving in with her father to the schoolhouse. She'd returned to the house the evening before the murders so that she could attend a family meeting. Down the hallway from where Robin was found, Lanyette was laying in bed, She'd suffered three gunshot wounds to the head. A post-mortem would later reveal that the first shot through her cheek wouldn't have been fatal, but either of the other two would have killed her instantly. In the next room, Margaret too lay dead in her bed. Like her daughter, her death was an instant. She'd been shot once, just above the left eye. The pathologist in the case would later note that she had survived some time before dying. Margaret's room led straight through to Stephen's, where the 14-year-old was found dead on the floor. Stephen had put up a fight. 
One bullet had gone through his hand as he tried to defend himself, but ultimately he had been strangled with his own t-shirt before being shot in the top of the head. Finally, in the lower floor of the house, there was Arawa, lying on the floor in the middle of her bedroom. She had been shot once in the forehead. The officers returned to David's room, where they found him huddled against the wall in the fetal position, crying hysterically. Suddenly his body began to jerk, as if he was having a seizure. Once it was over, he fainted, and the officers called in the ambulance crew to take a look at him. Then they had the unenviable task of checking each of the Banes to confirm that they were dead. Back in the living room, where David's father Robin lay dead on the floor, Forensic pathologist Alex Dempster had arrived. After checking Robin's body, he heard a buzzing sound coming from behind a green velvet curtain to his right. He parted the curtains to find an alcove, where the family computer sat switched on on a desk. Across the screen was a single line of text. You are the only one who deserved to stay. Next to Robin's body, there was David's 22 caliber Winchester rifle that had been equipped with a silencer. A spare magazine was next to Robin's hand, stood upright on its narrow side. It suggested that perhaps Robin had been the one to kill his wife, two daughters and son before turning the gun on himself. There was some evidence to suggest that Robin had been struggling with his mental health in the months leading up to the murders. Those working with Robin at the school had noticed a decline in his mental state, noting that he appeared deeply depressed to the point that it impaired his work teaching children. He was increasingly disorganised and struggling to cope. They reported his office and classroom as being dishevelled and untidy, with piles of unopened mail left on his desk. There had also been a worrying incident where a number of macabre stories written by students at the school had been published in the newsletter, one of them even depicting the murder of several members of a family. Mr Cyril Wilden, a former teacher and registered psychologist, had visited the school where Robin taught on several occasions and was of the opinion that he was suffering from clinical depression. He said that the stories children wrote were written in response to stimuli, and that he believed the stimuli had come from Robin's teaching. The Principals Association had also grown concerned about Robin's mental health, and the president of the association had organised a seminar for that July surrounding work-related stress. He devised the seminar specifically to help Robin, hoping that he could convince him to attend. Unfortunately, though, he never got the chance. It's not clear exactly what caused Robin and Margaret's marriage to deteriorate since their return from Papua New Guinea in 1988. While they were there, Margaret had been exposed to the beliefs of tribes in the local area, in spirits and special healing powers, previous lives and dream analysis. When they returned to New Zealand, her faith began to take over every aspect of her life. She had a key ring that she would use as a pendulum, a way for God to tell her what he wanted her to do, even for things as insignificant as what to pick up at the shops. She kept a detailed diary where she recorded her encounters with Belial, a Hebrew word for the devil, who she detected around the house, in the children, and particularly in her husband, Robin. If he did something as small as handing her the newspaper, she would have to clear it out of Bell, as she called it, and she would rededicate parts of the house that he had been in. All things considered, it's safe to say that Robin wasn't coping well with his work or home situation, but that didn't make him a murderer. As the only surviving member of the family and the person who discovered the scene, police wanted to speak to David as soon as possible, and his first interview took place the same day the bodies were found. David said that he'd got up at his usual time and headed off for his paper round at 545 Because he always ran this route, he liked to see how long it took him, and so he logged his return either 6.42 or 6.43. He headed straight to his room, where he hung up his newspaper bag and took off his shoes and walkman. He had some ink on his hands from the paper, so he went to the bathroom to wash it off, then put some clothes into the washing machine, including the jumper that he'd been wearing on his round. When he returned to his room, he noticed bullets on the floor that weren't there when he left, and the trigger lock to his rifle was laying on the floor. 
I had no idea what a trigger lock was, so in case you're not sure either, it's essentially a padlock for the trigger of a gun that prevents it from being fired. It was then that he found his mother dead in her room, before running to the living room where he saw his father on the floor. At first he said he wasn't sure why he'd headed directly into the living room, but later said that it was because it was where his father's influence was the strongest. He said that he was positive he hadn't gone into any other rooms in the house, despite telling emergency services on the phone that his entire family was dead. The time of the call to 111 had been logged as nine minutes past seven. When asked what he had been doing for the 25 minutes or so between him returning home and making the call, David had no explanation. He did say, however, that he had been spacing out recently and had done so just a couple of weeks earlier in the middle of a symphony recital. In his third interview, David's behaviour took an unusual turn. Emotional and crying, he began to talk about the black hands that had been coming to take his family away. It wasn't the first mention of these mysterious black hands either. He had also talked about them on the morning of the murders, as he lay crying on his bedroom floor, and again to his uncle after reading a newspaper article about the case. When pressed, he couldn't give any kind of explanation as to who these black hands belonged to or why they were coming to take his family. David had several injuries at the time of his arrest, including bruising to his forehead and a small scrape on his knee. But again, David couldn't explain them, and by now police were starting to get suspicious. Meanwhile, back at the house, a search was underway, hoping to unearth clues that would help police crack the case. They were in Stephen's room when they noticed something unusual amongst the clutter of the house. There was a lens from a pair of glasses on the floor, right next to where Stephen's body was found. Stephen never wore glasses as he had no need for them. David, however, did, and the frames were located in his bedroom. Under the bed in Stephen's room, police also found a pair of white, blood-soaked opera gloves, David's gloves, which he normally kept in his room. If Robin had planned to kill himself after the murders, why would he bother to wear a pair of gloves? Then, of course, there was David's gun. He himself had told police that no one else knew where he kept the key to the gun's trigger lock. On the 24th of June, at around 1pm, David Bain was charged with five counts of murder. It would be just under a year before the trial began on May the 8th of 1995. At trial, the prosecution put forward the theory that about 5am, perhaps earlier, David had taken his 22 calibre Winchester rifle and some ammunition out of his wardrobe. He then killed, in an unknown order, his mother, two sisters and his brother. During the struggle with Stephen, one of the lenses from the glasses David was wearing fell out onto the floor. He changed out of his bloody clothes before putting them in the wash, where he left bloodstains in the laundry room and the bathroom. At 5.45, he left the house at his usual time to go and start his paper round. He completed his round in less than an hour, returning to the family home at 6.42. Two minutes later, he switched on the computer before writing the message that was found on the screen. In the alcove where the computer was kept, David waited with his loaded rifle for his father to come in and pray, as he did every morning. Sure enough, his father came into the lounge and knelt down, where he was shot in the head at close range. After rearranging the scene to make it look like a suicide, David made his frantic call to the emergency services. The prosecution believed that his motive was money. Robin and Margaret had been putting cash aside for a new house which David stood to inherit, as well as the land in the house the Baines already owned. Whether it was possible for Robin to have committed suicide was a contentious issue in court. Robin was right-handed, yet the gunshot wound was on his left temple, the bullet moving in a diagonal trajectory through his head. What's more, after testing the distribution of gunpowder from varying distances, a forensic scientist concluded that the gunpowder found around the wound on Robin's head most closely resembled that of a shot with a 38 centimetre range, not what you would expect from a self-inflicted wound. A Winchester rifle is a long weapon in itself, but it was also equipped with a silencer, making it even longer than usual, Add a 38 centimetre range onto that, and a self-inflicted wound just didn't make any sense. 
The magazine that was found next to Robin's body was resting on its narrowest side, suggesting that there was a possibility it may have been placed there on purpose, as opposed to landing naturally on its wider edge. So not only was Robin's suicide called into question, but there was also evidence to suggest that he couldn't have killed the other members of the family either. The scene was a bloody one, particularly in Stephen's room where a struggle had taken place before he was murdered. But there was no trace of any blood except his own on Robin's clothing, and no blood at all on his socks and shoes. Yet bloodied sock prints were found in Margaret's room, going into and out of Lanyette's room, and in the hallway outside Margaret's room pointing towards the front door. Why would he have bothered to change clothes after the murders, only to turn the gun on himself? David's socks, however, did have droplets of blood on them, and traces of Stephen's blood were found on David's shorts. None of Robin's fingerprints were found on the rifle, but he wasn't wearing any kind of gloves when his body was discovered. Even if he had been wearing the gloves that were found in Stephen's room, he obviously must have taken them off when he shot himself in the head, so why were his fingerprints nowhere to be found? There were some bloodied fingerprints on the rifle, however, and those belonged to David. The rifle had also been smeared with blood, indicating that it had been wiped. In addition, there were no traces of any gunpowder anywhere on Robin's hands, which you would expect had he just fired a rifle in excess of eight times. The lens found in Stephen's bedroom also played a key part in the trial of David Bain. The glasses the lens belonged to weren't actually prescribed to David. In fact, they belonged to his mother, Margaret. David was short-sighted with a degree of astigmatism in one eye and wore glasses fairly regularly. A few days before the killings, his glasses were damaged and he took them to be repaired. An optometrist examined the glasses and concluded that they were of a similar prescription to David's, but not the same one that he was given two years earlier. In court, David testified that they had in fact belonged to his mother and that he borrowed them on occasion if his weren't available, but only if he was attending a lecture or watching TV. In contrast, the glasses were of absolutely no use to Robin. Sure enough, a photo was found of Margaret wearing the glasses in question. When asked how the lens had ended up in Stephen's room, David couldn't give an answer. The fact that the washing machine had been started shortly after the murders occurred seemed suspicious from the outset, even more so when you consider the fact that the washing machine and basin both had blood spots on top of them. One of the items that David had washed was a green jersey, with fibres that were an exact match for those found under Stephen's fingernails from when he was fighting for his life. In another case of convenient timing, experts had concluded that the computer, with its ominous message typed onto the screen, had been switched on at 6.44 that morning, just two minutes after David would have been due back from his round, and two minutes after the time that he himself had testified that he had arrived back home. As well as physical evidence, there were elements of David's testimony that were called into question during the trial. He described hearing Lanyette gurgling before he found his father dead in the lounge. This was presented to the jury as a clear indication of David's guilt, as the gurgling must have only occurred within minutes of her being fatally shot. In fact, in the Crown Solicitor's closing address, he stated, Only one person could have heard Lanyette gurgling. That person is the murderer. David and Robin were the only two suspects implicated in the Bain family murders, and there seemed to be an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that David was the culprit. But there was a potential motive for Robin that had been hidden from the jury. The investigation had unearthed some disturbing rumours about the Bain family. Lenyet's phone was registered in the name of a man named Dean Cottle, who police tracked down and interviewed three days after the murders. During the interview, Dean told them that he and Lanyette had become friends around ten months earlier, after they had met in a bar. She had told him that she had left home because she and her father had been having an incestuous relationship for about a year, and that she'd also been working as a prostitute. He said that just three days before the murders, Lanyette had told him that she was going to go home that very weekend to tell her family what had been going on. But as there was no evidence to support what Dean was saying, The judge dismissed it as hearsay, although he did note that it would have given Robin a motive to kill his family were it true. Dean was subpoenaed to appear as a witness at the first ruling, but didn't turn up and couldn't be located by police. 
He voluntarily attended the second ruling on May 26th, but was described as being in a state of confusion when questioned in court. As a result, he was deemed an unreliable witness, and the jury at the trial were never told what Dean had disclosed to the police about Lanya and her father. Police could find no other proof that Lanyard's allegations were true, and with both of the key witnesses dead, it seemed unlikely that they would ever know for sure. Following three weeks at trial, the jury retired at 11.45am on May 29th, 1995. Over nine hours later, they returned with a verdict. David Bain was guilty of five counts of murder, and he was later sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 16 years. It looked as though justice had finally been done, but over a decade later, the case would come crumbling to the ground. That concludes episode 11, part one, The Unsolved Murders of the Bain Family. We'll be back later this week with part two, but in the meantime, please go ahead and follow Case Remains on Instagram and Twitter, or check out our website, www.caseremains.com, where you'll find write-ups on missing persons cases and unsolved mysteries. Until next time, stay safe.